The amygdala are also thought to be closely associated with memory, so if you have an unpleasant experience and your amygdala are stimulated, an association quickly forms in your head. That's why the man uses scare tactics to mould your behaviour from an early age. A lot of kids' TV was so creepy it sometimes seemed the people behind it were deliberately trying to scare the viewer with eerie imagery, and the scarier a kid's show was, the more likely it will have lodged in our collective memory. I'm talking, of course, about all of. And now on BBC One, egg-shaped animation which everyone in the nation is certain to remember in 30 years' time. All of. <laughs> enjoying an afternoon snooze. Someone's not happy. That's his nest. What's going on in that little bird's mind? I suppose all animals are ultimately unknowable, even our parents. Little birdie's going up top, and he's got an audience. We're all passive observers of what follows. I wouldn't do that. Now, everything is over. The actors leave the stage. Yes, during my formative years, mushroom clouds were all the rage. Britain's doctors say 33 million people in this country may be killed and injured in a nuclear war. To my babyish eyes, it seemed every news bulletin consisted of nuclear paranoia, Mrs Thatcher, blood-curdling statistics about the inevitable apocalypse, and the only people trying to stop this madness seemed to be kindly dinner ladies and lofty off East Enders. If we have got peace camps, Non-violent direct action outside every nuclear base in this country. They can't shift us. Yeah, except maybe with uh, water cannons or, or tasers or, or bulldozers. Or I suppose they could always just walk in and physically pick you up. What I'm saying is they can shift you. Despite the high stakes, however, it was hard for the average viewer to picture a nuclear war. I mean, we'd seen what happened in Hiroshima, but that was black and white and crackly and seemed to mainly affect Japanese people living in the 1940s, so it didn't really count. What the average Brit needed was a no-nonsense visual guide to what could happen, and hallelujah, that's precisely what they got. In 1982, the BBC broadcast a QED special called A Guide to Armageddon, which simulated the consequences of one megaton nuclear bomb going pop a mile over St Paul's Cathedral. Apparently, the heat alone would be inconsiderate enough to slightly damage the cross on top of St Paul's, spoil a few windows, leave a Bible-looking dog-eared, slightly devalue the contents of the National Gallery and boil the serpentine a bit. It would be bad news for anyone who enjoys not burning to death in an incinerated car or bus, and even if you lived four miles away and were hiding indoors, it was probably going to go down as one of your least favourite afternoons, especially if you've been looking forward to reading Woman's Own. In fact, if you were even vaguely nearby, your body would frazzle like a carbonised lamb chop unless you were standing as far away as Wimbledon, at which point at least one of your eyebrows would survive. Yeah, it looks pretty nasty, but the ladies love a war wound, yeah? <laughs> You'd be beating them off with a stick. Albeit a burnt, smouldering, radioactive stick. Anyway, in case you're worried the situation seems hopeless, the show went on to highlight some of the defensive measures the average 1980s couple could take. Following the helpful Protect and Survive pamphlet, the duo whitewash their windows and construct a bijou shelter under the stairs, perfect for enjoying a cup of tea in. And they fare pretty well. The whitewash keeps 80% of the heat out. There may be fires in unprotected houses nearby, but Joy and Eric should survive. Hmm. At least for 17 seconds. Hmm. After that, the blast demolishes their terrace of houses. The QED Atomic Splattacular proved so entertaining it convinced the BBC to make Threads, possibly the most frightening drama ever broadcast on British television. Threads graphically depicted how a nuclear bomb could cause millions of pounds worth of improvement to Sheffield's architecture. The moment of detonation itself was brilliantly realised, rammed with stark, horrifying images that set amygdala across the nation lighting up like the residents of Sheffield. Jesus Christ, the dummy. And then just when you think things can't get any worse, they do. Because Threads keeps going, trudging into the grim aftermath as Sheffield is transformed into an almost Plymouth-style wasteland in which people eat rats like their cream buns and the cast of Last of the Summer Wine is hopelessly depressed. And even Ron Weasley isn't safe. 
guess if Threads had an overall theme, it was, oh, shit. The next morning, BBC reporters descended on Sheffield to gauge how the locals reacted to seeing their homes and workplaces destroyed. I quite enjoyed it, actually. But, uh, enjoyed uh, seems a strange word to use of such a harrowing play. Yeah, it may be, but uh, I didn't find it frightening at all. At around the same time, the Americans had a pop at nuclear drama themselves, with the vaguely more upbeat The Day After, which starred Steve Guttenberg in a tale of everyday burning, screaming Americans. Just like Threads, it depicted billowing mushroom clouds, which looked a bit like the world's grooviest lava lamp. And a hilarious sequence in which a kiddiewink gets a bit too much nuclear war in his eye. <laughs> uh, anyway, Steve Gutenberg survives by hiding in a shop. Although the uh, radiation does leave him looking a little less cocksure by the end. After US President Ronald Reagan saw this, he wrote in his diary that it was very effective and had left him greatly depressed. Each star, like our own sun, is a raging nuclear furnace. Each explosion is another spark of radiation. All life on Earth has reached its present form in company with radiation from this naturally occurring radioactivity. Nature even planted unstable atoms deep inside the Earth itself. To build up a nuclear energy release, the fissionable material must be of a certain size, shape, or density. It compresses the fissionable material to greater density to make it supercritical. One of the neutrons escaping from a split atomic nucleus will, in turn, split another, and a chain reaction is set up. This effect is called implosion. The detonators attached to the explosive are connected to a complex firing device, which can fire every detonator simultaneously. When all the explosive is detonated simultaneously, the nuclear material is compressed into a supercritical mass, which results in a nuclear explosion. Implosion-type weapons are nuclear safe because only the specially designed firing device can produce the simultaneous detonation of all the ordinary explosive. A gun-type device can increase the mass of fissionable material to a supercritical state instantaneously. One subcritical mass is propelled forcibly into another by an ordinary powder charge. The increased mass becomes supercritical. A multiplying chain reaction builds up until the nuclear explosion. Obviously, if any mechanical device keeps these two subcritical masses apart, the weapon is nuclear safe. The amount of energy generated by a nuclear explosion is enormous. Near the crater area, there is almost total destruction from blast and heat. And now large amounts of pulverized debris and molten earth are pulled up into the mushroom cloud. And this is how a single particle looks magnified several hundred times. A radioactive piece of matter from a nuclear explosion. These few particles can't do us any significant harm. You would receive less radiation in the middle of a tall building than on the top or bottom floors because there would be more distance and partitions between you and the source of the radiation, the fallout particles covering the roof and the ground around the building. Only an insignificant amount would get inside. Any material with enough weight will keep the penetrating rays from hurting us. Concrete, steel, and heavy construction materials provide good shielding from fallout radiation. And so would two feet of earth. And along with mass and distance, we have a third invaluable ally, time. There is a tenfold decrease in radiation rate for every sevenfold increase in time after detonation. For example, a level of 1,000 R per hour at one hour after the explosion would be reduced to 100 R per hour, seven hours following the explosion. At seven times seven hours, or in two days, the level would be down to 10 R per hour.